glory to God. But uh, we've been talking about the kingdom. This is of utmost importance because you're from a brand new lineage. You're from a brand new culture. Amen. I shared that with the guys yesterday. By the way, guys, it was we had a great breakfast, did we not? And there was 20 or 21 guys there yesterday. Amen. And it was a good time. And I shared a little bit about not compromising, but about the word. We are, because we are from a new place, um, a culture, uh, this culture is not to dictate to us and tell us what to do. We are to change the culture. Um, glory. I don't know if the body of Christ has been real good at that, but I do know that Thriving Life Church is better at it. <laughs> Amen. The people of Thriving Life Church are, we're going to change the culture. We're not going to fit in with the culture. We're going to change the culture. Amen. Hallelujah. But, but there is a culture, a kingdom culture that is so contrary, so contrary to what we're used to. And if we're not careful... Um, We'll let this culture begin to tell us, you know, how to live, um, tell us what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> In other words, what she just says, what life is or what death is. <laughs> and this culture will pretty much try to tell you that uh, it's offering life and our Adherence to the word of God and to the truth of God's word is death. That's what this culture will try to do. It try to flip it on us. The enemy will try to flip it on us and tell us that if you follow that, you'll die. Because it's rigid, it's hard. <laughs> but Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He says he's life. So let's not fall for that. And when, I, and when I say that, I say that uh, with passion because sometimes we get duped and, and we'll even be, I don't want to say overconfident because it's good to have a, a confidence, but we'll be overconfident as it's like, well, I would never let that happen. Well, let me tell you, I mean, no, the enemy's not going to show up in a red suit with horns and a pointy tail saying, hey, 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 here I am. What's presented to us is going to sound reasonable. <laughs> what's presented to us in this culture is going to be presented in such a way where we'll look at it and go, well, maybe I need to change the way I think. Maybe I need to change what I believe because that sounds reasonable. That looks right. It's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. You know, if you've ever been out in the wilderness and done any trapping or anything, um, it, it, you, you need to camouflage to be able to catch your prey. <laughs> you just don't talk to it and say, hey, come here, and then have the trap wide open, and they just walk right into it like, eh. <laughs> need to be cunning. I was just sharing with Hivani recently. I don't know what, how we got talking about it, but we were talking about hunting and so on and so forth. And, and one of the things that I did before we moved from Minnesota back in 2004 and started our, our new adventures in the things of God is uh, I got, was getting involved in the turkey hunting. And uh, I'll tell you what, you just don't go out and say, I'm just going to go out and shoot a turkey. And if, you're, if you have any knowledge of Domestic turkeys, you'll think, well, turkey hunting would be easy because domestic turkeys, they're the dumbest things that ever lived, man. It'll start raining and they'll look up at the rain and they'll drown. You say, what? So, yeah, they'll look up when it's raining and the raindrops will go in their nostrils and they'll actually drown themselves. They don't have enough sense to not look. But a wild turkey ain't that way. <laughs> I said, a wild turkey's not that way. And if that was one of the things I enjoyed about it was the challenge of outsmarting them. You had to outsmart them. My dad was an avid hunter, and he hunted all kinds of different game. And, and one of the main things, one of the things about hunting game, most game, is their sense of smell. They have a keen sense of smell, and when they smell human, you know, 
They're darting out of there. Well, that is the one thing that even a wild turkey didn't, it, whether they had a keen sense or not, the smell of humans didn't bother them. So you didn't have to worry about setting yourself up to hunt them in such a way that you were downwind and they wouldn't smell you. But you could not let them see anything. I mean, the slightest movement and... And my dad always said, he said, man, he says, if they had the sense of smell like deer and some of the things that he hunted, he says, along with their eyesight, he said, I don't know if anybody would ever be able to kill one. But thank God they didn't have that. See, there's ways to outsmart them. Yeah. We got to be that wise. We have to need to understand the kingdom that we come from. And there are ways, Jesus showed us ways to outsmart and overcome. And he gave us somebody that will help us in that arena, someone that is smarter than anybody else, and his name is Holy Spirit. I love what Pastor Mark Hankins says, as his dad told him, uh, is that if you listen to the Holy Spirit, he'll make you look smart. You may not be real educated, you may not have a higher education or whatever, but I tell you what you do have, if you're born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost, you got the Holy Spirit, and that is the smartest person ever that lives on the inside of you, and if you just train yourself to listen to Him, because the only thing He speaks is He speaks things of the Father, or you could, in other words, He speaks things from the kingdom. They come directly, kingdom source. Kingdom source. And if you train yourself to listen to that and obey that and follow that, whew, there's nothing that the enemy can bring your way, no matter how disguised and how camouflaged it looks. You'll go, mm, no, no, that's not my father. <laughs> that's not kingdom life. I know better than that. It looks good, but no, no, that's not kingdom life. You know, if I... Uh, I shared last week the scriptures in Philippians about Paul telling us that we're citizens of heaven. He was telling the Philippian church about being citizens of heaven. There's a couple other scriptures, and we'll just get to them quickly here. Uh, turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 11. 1 Peter 2 in verse 11. an interesting scripture here. Uh, in the New King James, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners or pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Notice it says there are sojourners or pilgrims. In the Amplified Version, it says, Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers, exiles, in this world, to abstain from the sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, lower nature of the way. Why does he tell us that? Why is Peter telling us that? Well, first off, you have to understand, he said, I urge you as aliens, as aliens. Most of us, many of us have heard that phrase before with regards to someone that's not a citizen of the United States. But see, we're not citizens of this world. Because Jesus said in John chapter 17, when he was praying for the church that was to be and praying for the disciples of that time, he said, I'm not of this world and neither are you. He was prophetically saying that you're, you're separate. You're going to be separate. You're going to be new creatures. You're not of this. Because you've received my word, it's changed you. Or it should change you and change the way you think and change the way you function, which means there's a whole new life. And you're not of this life. So you're going to have to, put, Jesus was praying that and praying for the, the church to come and for those disciples because he knew there was going to be a challenge to try to go back to thinking the same way. And now Peter here, who was one of those disciples, is actually making the same statement. He says, beloved, I implore you as aliens. Well, you got to look up sometimes, just look up words to kind of get the definition. I, I, I had a somewhat of an understanding of an alien. We're not talking about outer space, you know, flying around talking about someone that allowed no citizenship. And I looked it up, and one, one particular definition says a foreigner, especially one who is not a naturalized citizen. So once you get born again, you're not a naturalized citizen of this world any longer. You're a naturalized citizen of heaven. 
And to be a naturalized citizen of heaven, well, then you've got to understand uh, it's one thing to know that you, the Bible says you're a naturalized citizen and it's, you're an alien of this world, because that's really what Peter's saying here is you're an alien of this world, which means your citizenship has been changed. And it's not just been changed because uh, you moved from one place to another, because there's many people that are not citizens of the United States. They move from another country to this country. They go through some tests and go through some schooling and some learning and teaching to learn everything about the United States, and then they're sworn in as citizens. They take the test. They're sworn in. But because we're born again, it's even to a greater level. We're not just moving from one citizenship to another. We actually, our old citizen or our old self died doesn't exist anymore, and we've been born again. So we've been born citizens of heaven. We're naturalized citizens. We just didn't do a transfer. We just didn't. We're, we're not studying the word to become citizens. We're studying the word to find out what type of citizens we are. <laughs> See, when someone comes from another country, they don't study the things of the United States to find out who they are, they're not a citizen yet. They're studying so they can then become a citizen. Just the opposite for us. We're in the Word of God, and we study the Word of God and look at the Word of God and listen to the Holy Ghost to find out who we already are. It's a big key there, who we already are. See, everything about a believer is knowing who you already are. It's not, you're not learning to become something. You're not learning to become, uh, 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 to, to act a certain way. You're learning who you are so it just comes naturally. You're a naturalized citizen. Yeah. It should be natural to function like a kingdom citizen. Yeah. Now, I know that it doesn't in the beginning seem like it comes natural. But yet, that's not necessarily true. Is because when you do something, all of us have fa encountered this. But when you do something that's contrary to the Word of God, you get that, uh. That's because there's a, a natural knowing when you get born again. That wasn't right. Yeah. Why? Because there's a citizenship. When you're born again, there's, there's that knowing who you are on the inside. Right. And Peter is saying here, consider yourself aliens. Why? So you don't follow that. Uh. You're more aware of. Uh. So you don't actually step out into those things and get the uh, that you get the uh before you step out. You begin to walk in your citizenship and you don't walk contrary to your citizenship. Now, I'm going to look at the definition again. It says a foreigner, especially one who is a naturalized citizen of the country where they're living. The Miriam, uh-oh, there it is. It says, relating, belonging, or owing allegiance to another country or government. That's, that's a whole other uh, definition of citizenship. We owe our allegiance to another country. We don't owe any allegiance to this country. Now, I'm not... I'm not talking about disrespecting the United States of America. I'm not going down that path. Don't, don't even try to go down that path or take me down that path. I'm just simply stating is we owe an allegiance to heaven. And what is that allegiance that we owe to heaven? Is to function like a kingdom citizen. Because Jesus paid a really great price to become brand new citizens, to become naturalized citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And we owe an allegiance to that. Well, what does it mean to owe an allegiance to that? It means that we do all that we can to represent and walk in everything that's been bought and paid for for us. That new country that we've been born into. Glory to God. Another definition is, is just simply says, coming from another world. To be an alien means that you've just come from another world. Well, guess what? You've come from another world. And that's actually true, because when God took out of you the stony heart, that man that was separated him, the, dead, the, uh, the, the spirit that wasn't born of God, when he took that out, that new spirit that he put within you, where do you think it came from? It came from the kingdom. Yeah, that's right. 
That's what the scripture says in John chapter 3, verse 16. He tells, when he tells Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. Or in other words, you must be born from above. There's a, there's a reality, a truth that actually took place. When you got born again, you got born from above. Which means you're born from another world. That's why when you look at somebody now or you look at your spouse or whatever, you can say, man, you are just out of this world. <laughs> it's the truth. You can take it as a compliment. Say, thank you very much because I am out of this world. <laughs> Amen. Amen. See, the Bible tells us over in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the hall of faith, there where it talks about those in the Old Testament that operated in faith, um, it tells us, well, let's turn over there. While you're turning over there, I'll share another scripture with you here. Uh, for our 1 Peter 2, 11, same scripture we've been talking about while you're turning over to Hebrews chapter 11. In the uh, complete Jewish Bible, the CJB, it says, dear friends, it says 1 Peter 2, 11, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents, let me know we are just temporary residents. That's all we are, is temporary residents here. We've been sent here by God to accomplish a work, and that is, is to advance the kingdom of God and advance righteousness in this earth that he made that he still owns. He hasn't given up on it. He hasn't given up on humanity, aren't you glad? And we're just temporary residents here. About one place in the Bible says, you're just passing through. That's why Peter said, you're sojourners, which is in other words, you're just passing through. You're just, you're just vagabonds, you're gypsies. You know, that's the way Abraham functioned. I mean, they were wanderers. They didn't really set up anywhere permanently until they were to get to, get to the promised land. That was a permanent residence, which is a representation of kingdom living. Everything within the promised land was kingdom living. God said, I want you to go to this land because you're going to experience kingdom life. And why did he tell him that? Is because the kingdom life that he had intended for humanity was the Garden of Eden. But God loves his creation so much that even though he had to kick Adam and Eve out of their Garden of Eden, and the main purpose he had to kick them out of there is because the tree that they ate of, which brought death, there was also another tree in that garden, which was the tree of life. And he knew enough to know that if they couldn't keep away from the tree that they were told not to eat, they would go over and partake of the tree that, that they were supposed to eat of, which was the tree of life. And they'd go over there and they would live eternally in their fallen state. And God said, hey, guys, we got to kick them out of here. And we're going to put flames, flaming angels, man, at the gates so they can't ever get back in because I love them so much. I cannot allow them to come and eat of the tree of life because they'll be stuck in this state forever. And I won't let that happen. But then God comes along with Abraham and picks a chosen people out. He's setting up a kingdom people with Abraham. He's pulling them out of the world, telling Adam, leave everything that you know. See, to be a kingdom citizen and understand the fullness of being a kingdom citizen, you got to leave what you know. That's what a lot of us don't like to do. We don't want to leave what we knew. We've got two strong of attachment to the things that we knew and too much of a comfort level in the things that we knew. But God's telling Abram, wasn't Abraham at that time yet, God's telling Abram, you're going to leave everything that you know, get out of there because I'm going to set up a new race, a new people, a people that are mine and that are going to represent me and represent kingdom life. And you're going to go to a promised land and that promised land is going to be a representation of what Eden used to be like as much as I can allow you to function in and you're going to live in kingdom type living in this land. And to live in that kingdom type of living, see guys, we're going to need to get this. To live that type of lifestyle, what else did he tell the Jewish people, the Hebrews and Abraham? When you get there, you got to drive out every inhabitant. Yeah. See, we don't want to drive out the inhabitants. Yeah. We want to cohabitate with the inhabitants. Well, when you look in the scriptures, it never went well with the Israelites when they cohabitated. God said, you're separate. Well, Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, and us being sanctified and set apart, we need to kick some things out. <laughs> and 
And you only can do that when you understand that you're not part of what you're kicking out. But if there's an attachment to what you're kicking out, we'll think we're still a part of what we're kicking out, and we don't want to kick that out. And there could be a myriad of reasons why we don't want to kick that out. Maybe we like it too much. Maybe we really don't want to kick it out yet. Maybe we think that offers more than what the new life, the new kingdom life. See, the Israelites, why did they go mingle with everybody that God told them not to mingle with? Is because they thought that the world was living pretty good, and they weren't. So we're going to go mingle. Why do you think the Israelites said they wanted a king? Because they said, well, the rest of the world has a king. They seem to be doing pretty good. We want a king too. And Samuel's like, you don't need a king, you got God. No, we want a king. We want someone to rule over us. And it's like, you've got God. You've got the king of the kingdom, who he has called you to, to be your king. And they said, oh, no, 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 we don't want that. We want a king. See, we're not much different if we're not careful. But he's called us to be different. I said he's called us to be different. Why? Because we are. He made us different. He made us different. See, that's why when you know that he's made you different, it's not so hard and difficult to be different. But when you think you're still the same and you have attachments, which will tell you you haven't changed. See, when I look at all of you, I see changed people. Because you're children of God. I don't see behaviors. I don't see shortcomings. I don't see flaws. Why? Because you don't have any. In Christ, you're complete. I see you the way the Father sees you. Amen. And this is of utmost importance. Y'all over to Hebrews chapter 11. I don't forget. We'll share this and then we'll, we'll, we'll receive the offering and, do, and uh, do the announcements. Hebrews chapter 11. See, all of this, the, the reason why this is so important and why I'm, I'm so adamant on preaching it um, and being, have been is because if we don't understand our, our new citizenship and that we're aliens of this world, and I know we can all quote the scriptures and, you know, like, well, I'm not of this world. The Bible says I'm not of this world. I'm just in it. I, I understand that. I've, I've said the same thing. And to a very small degree, I understood that. But the more I press into who I am as a kingdom citizen, as a heaven citizen, the reality is, is there's nothing in this world, of this world, the God of this world, the principality and powers of the air. There's nothing that can get on me, tell me what to do, uh, cause me to go down a path that I don't need to go down, is because I, I have a higher king, yeah. and his name is King Jesus. Yeah. And he is seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father right now. And there's even going to be a day where he's going to come riding in on a white horse to even take up the authority. And we're going to ride with him. We're not going to be sitting back and he's going to come in. When, when he comes back like that, we're going to be riding in with him because we are kingdom citizens. Yeah. We are kingdom citizens. Man, when that gets, continues to grow on the inside of you and build on the inside of you and you separate yourself from this world and this world system and you begin to tap into the kingdom system and what the kingdom has to offer because you're a citizen and it's rightfully yours because you are a citizen. See, if you're a citizen of the United States, it's afforded you all the rights of, the, of citizenship. Well, guess what? You're a citizen now of the kingdom of God, which means it affords you all the rights, legal rights. You have a legal right to access everything that the kingdom of heaven has to offer. Yeah. Everything. That's why you can have heaven on earth. That's why an ambassador that goes into another country, an American ambassador, a U.S. ambassador, has all the rights as if they were living in the United States. They have it wherever they're living. And by all rights, nobody better touch them. 
Because if they do, they've got the entire United States to back them up. Some of us in our times have seen where there's been attacks on, on the U.S. Embassy. And guess what? The Marines show up. <laughs> because it's like, uh, it might be in this country, but that thing that you just attacked is actually United States land. And all of the powers and all of the rights and all of the laws that are established in the United States pertain to this embassy that you just placed an attack on. So, which means if you place an attack on that, you've placed an attack on the United States. And if you place an attack on the United States, that means all of the military, all the power, all the authority that the United States holds is coming down on you. Yes. Well, do you know what? If the enemy tries to throw an attack on us, it's the same way. Do we really believe that, though? We need to, as citizen. When the enemy tries to pull a sneak attack on you, that means all the power of heaven will stand up and fight for you and represent you and say, no, 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 no. But when you call on the kingdom, when you call on God, when you call on the Holy Ghost, you need to know that that's what's actually coming to fight for you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. The heavenly hope, it says here, titled my, my Bible. It says, these all died in faith, talking about uh, those that have died. It says, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. That's why they were able to stand in faith, because they knew they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. They weren't part of this earth. They knew there was something greater. It says, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. <laughs> a homeland. They, they, uh, again, they're saying here, in other words, this isn't our home. That's why we can exercise and put our faith in something greater. Because we know everything that this life has to offer, everything about this place where we're presently existing, living right now, we're just residents here. It's not our true homeland. We've got a homeland that we're chasing after. It says, and truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. In other words, it's saying what God called them out of, what God called Abram out of, and all those that were of the lineage of the Hebrew or of the Israelites, because God called them out to be separate, had they had mind of, or had they recalled, or had they thought about, however you want to put it, if they'd have put their mind on, well, man, that life was sure better. And we see that's what the Israelites did when they were delivered. And why are we any different? The, uh, when they were delivered out of Egypt, that was a type and shadow of the world. God delivers them out of the world, and they're not out of there. And they, they come out with no sickness or disease. It says there wasn't one feeble among them. So there obviously was sick and feeble ones among them for God to reference that there wasn't, a sick, there wasn't one sick or feeble among them. So God delivers every single Hebrew, approximately 3 million, delivers them whole. No sickness as they're leaving a picture. This is a picture of the world. As you're delivered, you're leaving the picture of the world, which means now there's no more sickness and disease on you. And there was no poverty because they took what they had need of. Matter of fact, the world even said, get out of our face, man. Take what you want. Just get out of here. You're nothing but trouble to us. And they're not, God does all that, and they're not out of there too long, and they start grumbling. What'd you do, Moses? Take us out here to die. It'd be better off if we were back in Egypt. Now, would we say that? Well, sometimes when we're learning and leaning on the world and tapping into the world and thinking about, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? <laughs> That's really what we're doing. It's just like, you know what? It'd be a lot better if I just tapped into the way I used to live tapped into what the world has to offer because at least I might live. Or at least I'll get by. I won't be left out here to die. Well, I don't know about you, but I'll speak of myself. There's times where I've had those thoughts when you're standing in faith and you're thinking, dear Lord, am I just left out here to die? Well, you got to throw the rest of the scripture with it. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So no, you ain't left out there to die. It may look like it. It may feel like it, but you're not. And as you're going through the shadow of the valley of death, guess what? You'll go through it. 
You'll come out on the other side. And when you come out on the other side, you'll go, dear Lord, what was I complaining about? (laughs) But if we're mindful, see, that's part of, this is one of the greatest things about the renewing of the mind. Because if we don't renew the mind, we'll, and even when you do renew the mind, you'll sometimes become mindful of the old way. But as you renew your mind and become strong and begin to walk out the renewness of your mind, even if you become mindful or there's thoughts that come up about the old way, the old life, the old world, something other than the kingdom that you're now a part of, even when it comes up, you go, no, 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 wait a minute. I've experienced the goodness of God way too much. I've seen victory. See, when I was sharing the testimony of mine, I've experienced too many good things of God to know that he won't heal, that he won't deliver me. Come on. I've experienced way too much of God. I've experienced way too much of God to go back to be mindful and go back to go, you know what, maybe this doesn't work. It works, and it works every time. We're kingdom citizens. I said we're kingdom citizens. Glory to God. We're kingdom citizens. We're not of this world. We're of another world. And we don't have to wait till we get to that other world, get get back to the world that we came from to be partakers of that because when God sent us in here, he sent that world with us to live on the inside of us. That's why Jesus told the Pharisees, uh, it's kind of... You've got to look into the original text. When he told the Pharisees, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's really not the original text. That's not what it says because they weren't born again at that time in the gospels when he said that. He was actually stating the kingdom of God is amongst you or in front of you. So he was a representation of the kingdom. Well, because he came to live on the inside of us, now we can say the same thing and walk the same way. The kingdom of God, when we stand in front of an unbeliever, If need be, we could make that statement. I don't know if there's necessarily a need to make that statement, but we are the kingdom of God standing in front of them. Why? Is because God come up to take up residence on the inside of you and you've been born of the kingdom. So the kingdom is standing right in front. That's why the power that's been given us has the ability to alter and change everything in this natural arena. Can you see the value of understanding the kingdom? How many know that we, got a, we can do better at the, representation of the representation of the kingdom and knowing that we are kingdom citizens? Because kingdom citizens don't bow their knee to the God of this world or anything that this God of this world has created. We don't bow our knee. Jesus dealt with that issue. He defeated them, so now they, they bow their knee to us. But many times when the attacks come, we think, we, we start to like, <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah, devil, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. It's like, no. I don't know about you, but I'm not bowing my knee to him. He got me. No, he doesn't have any power. He's just pulling our leg. Amen. He's been stripped. I said, he's been stripped. He said, well, what happens if you get knocked down? Get back up. <laughs> My pastor back in Minnesota used to make a statement. You've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. He's like, it's my bat, it's my ball. I play till I win. I mean, you get out on the field, you brought the equipment. Game ain't over until I say it's over. (laughs) Said, well, it looks like the devil's winning. Oh, no, there's another inning. (laughs) How many innings are there? As many as it takes until that score says, I've won. (laughs) Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, as kingdom citizens, let's let's function in the the giving power. We're going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Amen.